Hi, Patty, this is Chris. I'm just testing my microphone. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Chris. Great, okay. Are. Good, thanks. Great. Um, Mark, I am trying to promote you uh, to panelist, and I'm not sure if you're getting that message to um, promote. I see that you're on as an attendee. Patty Cohen just called and uh, she has the date. Hi, Paloma. Thank you for joining us today for interpretation services. I'm going to go ahead and um, enable the interpretation channel for Spanish and put you in the Spanish channel. And if you can commence at the top of the meeting as uh, when Chair Cisco calls the meeting to order. Um, Pablo is going to stay on the main channel for a moment or two to introduce how the public can participate on the meeting. And then he will also be moved into the Spanish channel um and then you too can switch on and off roles as you see fit um, there may be an opportunity for a spanish-speaking member of our community to make a public comment at that time i will ask the inactive translator or interpreter to raise their hand and i'll bring you back over to the main channel to help facilitate public comment okay thank you Mark, can you hear us? I see you're on as an attendee. And I've been trying to promote you, but maybe you don't, you can't hear us. Okay, you're on. Hello? Hi, Mark. Can you Hi, hear I'm us? I'm present. I got in, so thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
For those of you just joining the meeting, uh, Life's Translation in Spanish is available and members of the public or the staff wishing to listen in Spanish can join the Spanish channel by clicking on the interpretation icon in your Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you only hear the Spanish translation. Pablo, would you please restate this in Spanish? Para los que recién se unen a la reunión, interpretación en vivo al español está disponible y los miembros o personal que deseen escuchar en español pueden unirse al canal. Para unirse, haga clic en el icono de interpretación en la barra de herramientas de Zoom que parece un globo terráqueo. Una vez se una al canal de español, se recomienda que apague el audio primario para que solo escuche la interpretación al español. Thank you, Pablo. I'm going to go ahead and put you over into the Spanish channel along with Paloma. I just want to check. It looks to me like we have a quorum. Is it okay to go ahead and call the meeting to order or should I wait? Um, no, you do have a quorum and you can call the meeting to order when you're ready, Chair. Okay, great. Um, with, I will call our uh, meeting to order, the Charter Review Committee of the City of San Jose and ask for roll call, please. Thank you. Um, Member Weeks? Here. Member Walsh? Here. Member Villalobos? Member Pitts? Here. Member Oliveras? Here. Member Minor? Here. Member Miller? Member Mazia? Here. Member Martinez? Member Ling? I'm here. Thank you. Member Close? Here. Member Gudinho? Here. Thank you. Member Diaz? Member Cunningham? Here. Thank you. Member Condren? Here. Member Byrne? Here. Member Bartley? Here. Member Badenford? Here. Member Barber? Member Arizona? And Chair Cisco? Here. Okay, let me just go back. Member Villalobos, have you joined us? Um, I'm here, but I'm not as a panelist. Okay, well, we'll promote you to a panelist and I'll show you present. Okay, thank you. Member Miller, have you joined us? Member Martinez, have you joined us? Member Diaz, have you joined us? Member Barber, have you joined us? Member Arizona, have you joined us? 
Okay, let the record show that all committee members are present for, with the exception of committee members Arizon, Barber, Diaz. Oh, Martin. I'm right here. Okay, thank you. Diaz, thank you. Okay, so let the record show that committee members are here with the exception of committee members Arizon, Barber, Martinez, and Miller. Okay. And then you have some housekeeping notes you wanna give oh, us? Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> So committee members, please keep your audio on mute unless you are speaking. And then as members of the public join the meeting via Zoom, they will be participating as attendees. Your microphone and camera will be muted. If you are calling in from a telephone and choose to speak during the public comments portion of today's agenda, for privacy concerns, the host will be renaming your viewable phone number to resident and the last four digits of your phone number. The City of Santa Rosa is committed to creating a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption. We will not tolerate any hateful speech or actions and are well staffed to monitor that everyone is participating respectfully or they will be removed. And if necessary, we will also immediately end the meeting. Public comments will be heard after each agenda item is presented. After each agenda item is presented, Chair Cisco will ask for committee members comments and then open it up for public comment. If you are participating from Zoom or by telephone and wish to make a live public comment on a specific agenda item, at the time public comment is opened by Chair, Sk Chair Cisco for that item, please use the raised hand feature. If you are calling in via telephone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. Throughout today's agenda, when Chair Cisco calls for public comment, an interpreter will be prepared to assist anyone needing interpretation services. Those using interpreter support will be afforded additional time for your public comment as required by the Brown Act. We ask those listening in on the Spanish channel but wishing to make a public comment to turn off the interpretation channel entirely at the time you hear your name called so you can join the main channel to make your public comment heard and translate it into English. This icon may now look like a circle with an ES in the middle and the word Spanish underneath. You can then rejoin the Spanish channel at the conclusion of your comment to continue listening to the meeting in Spanish. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to um, public comments on non-agenda uh, matters. With which is the time for any member of the public uh, that wishes to address the committee on matters of interest to the committee that aren't listed tonight uh, as an agenda item. And if you are uh, participating by Zoom, uh, please raise your hand and you'll be called on and asked to unmute. If you're dialing in by phone, you would uh, do star nine and uh, you will be uh, allowed to speak for three minutes. So with that, I'll open uh, the public comment on non-agenda matters and ask for uh, Ms. Williams to let me know if there's anyone wishing to speak. Thank you, Chair Cisco. I'll step in for public comment. Uh, the first public comment will be from Joe. Okay. Joe, I've enabled your speaking permissions. Please unmute your mic and proceed with your comment. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Joe Leadham speaking to you. Uh, thanks for permitting me to be here. Uh, several weeks ago, I sent you all an email. In that email, I suggested that you might want to consider amending the city charter to reduce the signature requirements for citizen-sponsored referendum and initiative voting. Today, I'm here to provide you with an important update on where things stand on that issue and to suggest a possible next step. First, here's the update. I was recently able to speak briefly with Sue Gallagher about whether the city in fact has the power to unilaterally reduce signature requirements. While nothing in life is ever completely certain, from what we discussed, it appears that the city does have the power to unilaterally lower those signature requirements. 
Sue, hopefully I'm stating things correctly. If I'm not, please feel free to correct me when I'm done. Now, the question is, should you proceed? Should you, the Charter Review Committee, seek to put forth an amendment that reduces the signature requirements for referendums and initiatives in the city? That is the question on the table. In the very short amount of time that I have right now, let me attempt to make the case for doing so. To make my case, I'll keep things simple and focus on just three reasons. The three reasons are these. Number one, your support for reducing signature requirements would make Santa Rosa a more democratic city. If inclusivity is your goal, this one action would do a lot to prove your commitment to it. You would be sending a real concrete message to Santa Rosa citizens that they now have a viable way to become involved in the city's decision-making process. Number two, reducing signature requirements would lead to better community-wide decision-making. People would be more engaged in the issues. And when the issues were voted upon, all would know the issue had had a full and fair hearing. Number three, as Santa Rosa became more democratic, your efforts could show the way forward for other cities, counties, the state of California, and maybe even the country itself. The country's in trouble. Santa Rosa could show the way, show the way forward. So those are the three reasons for proceeding. As the next step, you might wanna hold a special meeting to discuss this topic in more detail. If you were to invite me and the meeting took place in person, I would also treat for pizza and drinks. One final comment. You have in front of you an opportunity to make a really big difference. Your decision on liberalizing signature collection is arguably the most important voting improvement measure that I know of. It is amazing to me that you have this possibility right in front of you there here in Santa Rosa. I hope you take advantage of it. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thanks for your time and attention. Great, thank you, Mr. Leadham. And Ms. Manith, anyone else? Sure, Cisco, I see no additional hands being raised via Zoom. Okay, great, thanks for that. So with that, go ahead and uh, close the uh, public comment period on non-agenda items. And on to um, approval of our minutes. We do have two sets of minutes tonight. Um, First, uh, our December 15th uh, meeting. Any questions, comments on those? Not seeing any. So then those will stand as printed. Uh, next are our January 5th, uh, 2022 regular meeting. Any corrections, comments on those minutes? Not seeing anything on those. So those will stand as printed as well. All right, so with that, we'll go ahead and move on to our scheduled items, beginning with item 4.1, uh, which is our standing uh, item on equity principles. Um, uh, Sue, I'm not sure, will we to get another presentation on this or is this just our standing item? And I'll go ahead and um, call on the committee to see if they wanna do any additions. Sure, this is a, a standing item. Um, the copy of the uh, equity principles that was attached to the agenda uh, has not been changed since uh, last meeting other than to remove the draft uh, watermark. Um, but this is a time for uh, you to um, uh, weigh in or speak to the equity principles and Socorro Shields is here and uh, on screen and I welcome uh, any comments that she might like to make as well. And then I hand it over. Okay. Um, Sakura, do you have any comments you'd like to make now before I call on the committee to see if they have anything they want to change, add, correct? No. No. That was simple. <laughs> okay. Uh, committee members, any uh, comments, questions on, on our equity principles, our standing item. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, do you wanna call uh, for public comment on this uh, agenda item? So uh, with that, I will ask for public comment on this item 4.1, our uh, equity principles. 
And again, repeat if you're uh, participating by Zoom, use your raised hand feature to speak. If you're participating by phone, hit star nine and you'll be called on to speak for a few minutes. And I would ask Ms. Manis to let me know if anyone's waiting to speak on the, on the equity principles. There are no hands being raised via Zoom for this comment or for this comment period. Great. Um, so with that, um, I'll close that comment, uh, public comment period and um, Chair, oh, sorry. Sorry, yes. The I was just gonna say Chair Sisto, so now with, if there are no further questions and if there is support from the members, this will be the final version. Those are also updated and final definitions. They will be translated, PDF, shared, the um, graphic attention paid to them to make them slightly more visibly pleasing. And then um, they'll be finalized uh, if, if that's the, the group's um, desire. Okay. Um, anyone have any opposition to that? Sounds good to me. <laughs> so, okay. Well, thanks again, Sakaro, for doing that. It's a lot of work. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank and, you for your hard uh, efforts. So with that, we'll go ahead and move on to our um, meaty item tonight, item uh, number 4.2, which is the direct elect at large mater uh, item. And I believe Sue and Rob will be giving a presentation on that. Uh, yes, thanks uh, Chair Cisco. Um, and so today we'll begin our discussion uh, of the, on the possibility of moving to a direct elect at large mayor. Um, and today we'll be setting the framework and we will just begin our discussion. Um, we will be continuing the item on to our next meeting. And in the next meeting, we will go a little deeper and we'll have some speakers to talk about um, their experiencing experiences. Uh, we're hoping to have a couple of mayors or council members from cities with an elected mayor. And we're also hoping to have a city manager uh, with uh, some relevant experience. So today sets the framework, today begins our discussion, and then next week will, or next meeting in two weeks, we'll continue and dive a little deeper. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to start with just an outline of how this presentation is gonna go. Um, I know that many of you have a lot of experience uh, with the city and with the city government, including a couple of our former mayors, um, but I know others uh, do not have that depth of experience. So we're gonna begin with um, an overview of what our current city structure looks like. How is the city government structured? How is the council structured? What are the mayor's roles and responsibilities? That'll be our first section. Second, we'll talk a little bit about why might we move to an elected mayor? Um, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? What are the issues that we're trying to address? Um, is there a problem? And if so, is an elected mayor um, the solution? So kind of that pros and cons of an elected mayor and, and just at a very general level. I don't go into a lot of detail there. And then finally, we'll talk about what are some of the key elements um, that we should consider if uh, in formulating a proposal. Um, so that will, that, that's a list of about six or seven items. Um, so let's begin. Next slide. Okay, that, thank you, uh, you're ahead of me. Um, we'll begin with our current city structure. Um, as I think most of you know, the city council is the legislative body of the city. Uh, it is responsible for establishing all the city policies and priorities at a high level. City council uh, is the body that enacts city ordinances and the city council also uh, is responsible for approving all significant city transactions. Um, that would include establishing a significant new programs, um, significant purchases involving large dollar amounts, um, and of course, approving the annual budget also. The city manager, and this is gonna be important as we get further into an at-large mayor and a strong mayor versus a strong city manager structure. 
it's important to understand what the city council's role currently is and then what the city manager's role is. Um, the council as a whole uh, appoints uh, both the city manager and the city attorney. Those are the only two uh, city employees that the council itself appoints. Uh, the city manager is generally a professional with experience uh, in public administration. Our, our new city manager has very extensive experience uh, as did our former city manager. City manager uh, acts as the administrative head of the city um, government and is responsible for um, city operations and for implementation of the council's policies and programs. Um, the city manager hires and oversees all city employees, um, again, other than the city manager himself or herself and the city attorney, uh, oversees all the city programs, all the city departments, city manager proposes the budget, city, act, uh, city manager acts as emergency manager in most situations. A whole host of responsibilities lie with the city manager. Santa Rosa currently operates under a strong city manager uh, form of government. And what does that mean? Um, again, that means that the council sets the policies and priorities at a high level and then leaves implementation of those policies and programs and ordinances uh, to the city manager. Of course, the city manager remains uh, subject to full council oversight, um, but by charter, um, the city council cannot dive down into the next layers, into the um, departments or into individual employees other than through the city manager. So that is a strong city manager form of government. Um, next slide. So turning now to the city council, um, it's of course the legislative body of the city. It meets at least twice a month. That is by charter. Charter requires at least two meetings, each, regular meetings each month. Um, the city council uh, can act only when it has a quorum. Quorum is the majority. That would be four members of the seven member council. And the council takes actions as a whole, as a single body. Uh, individual council members uh, don't have power uh, to enact ordinances or adopt resolutions on their own. And the council takes its actions through ordinances, resolutions, or just by motion. And all of those actions require uh, the affirmative vote of, um, I have that, that, that bullet is not typed correctly. It's the affirmative vote of a majority of the total membership of the council and that is four affirmative votes. So even if there are only five council members present uh, at a meeting, any action still requires four affirmative votes. And then some actions, um, adoption of urgency ordinance, certain uh, real estate transactions and others require a supermajority vote. And that can be a five votes, uh, a five out of seven. It can sometimes be six out of seven, sometimes a unanimous vote. Next slide. So you may all be familiar with uh, how the city council is composed, um, but it is under section four of the city charter, a seven member council. Um, and prior to 2018, all council members were elected by citywide vote. The top voters were the ones that were uh, placed onto, um, onto the city council. In 2018, uh, under threat of litigation, the city did uh, decide to move to a district-based election of council members. 2018 was the first uh, of those elections. Um, and uh, 2020 completed that process and the city's now divided into seven council districts and each district elects one council member. Next slide. So we have now seven district representatives. So how are the mayor and the vice mayor selected? Again, um, most of you or many of you will already know this, um, but section 15 uh, provides that once uh, the new council is seated, that seven member council selects one of its members to serve as mayor for a two year term. And then the seven member council uh, next selects another of its members to serve as vice mayor uh, for uh, just a one year term. Next slide. In terms of term limits, the charter uh, provides that no council member uh, may serve as mayor for more than one consecutive 
term. So we do have a new mayor every two years. A council member, however, may serve more than one term as mayor provided the terms are not consecutive. And uh, we have a couple of examples uh, right here on our committee of folks who did that. Um, and I, just in terms of the two year, um, two year term and the uh, no consecutive term, just by way of comparison, um, board of supervisors, um, the chair with re similar responsibilities to the mayor uh, rotates every year, just a one year, rotates around. Um, and it's not an election, it's a simple rotation by um, district number. So um, as to the vice mayor, the charter provides there's no limit on the number of consecutive terms a vice mayor may serve. Uh, and pursuant to the charter, the mayor and the vice mayor both do serve at the pleasure of the council and they uh, may be removed from their, from their positions at the will of the council. Next slide. Um, so we've talked about how do we get the mayor and vice mayor? What are the, now what are the roles and responsibilities first of the mayor and then we'll talk about the vice mayor. So this is generally the list that's set forth in the charter. Um, charter provides the mayor will serve as the executive head of the city. Uh, the mayor presides over all council meetings, unless they're absent. Um, the mayor establishes the agendas, agendas for council meetings um, with, uh, in collaboration really with the city manager. We have a, a meeting each uh, week uh, to set the agenda for the following uh, council meetings. Um, the mayor also um, appoints committees of the council, subcommittees of the council, and uh, selects the chair for those committees. Um, and those um, subcommittees can be very significant. A lot of initial work takes place in those subcommittees. You know, a couple examples. Um, we have the public safety subcommittee that was created um, in response to the 2020 protests. We have a climate action subcommittee, an economic development subcommittee, a downtown um, subcommittee, uh, and a whole host uh, of others. Next slide. The mayor delivers an annual state of the city address. Um, the uh, a mayor also acts as a ceremonial representative of the city and a spokesperson of the city. And you see that uh, particularly critical on uh, important issues that face the city, as well as when the city is facing critical, uh, critical moments. Um, for example, in the fires, we often heard from the mayor um, uh, communicating uh, to all of the city residents. Um, the mayor also appoints, uh, makes the city appointments to all county, regional and state bodies um, with the approval of the majority of the council. Um, also, um, the mayor is not listed here, um, also appoints the chairpersons of each of the city boards, the commissions and committees. Uh, the mayor uh, acts as chief negotiator on behalf of the city with county, regional, state, and federal bodies and agencies, um, although obviously sometimes delegates that to uh, staff. Next slide. The mayor uh, does sign a lot of documents on behalf of the city, and that includes all ordinances that are adopted by the council, all council resolutions, and if uh, authorized by the council, the mayor will sign other legal uh, documents, um, including um, real estate uh, acquisitions, certain types of contracts, etc. The charter provides that in the case of a riot, insurrection, or extraordinary emergencies, um, the mayor may assume general control of the city's government and all its branches and be responsible for the suppression of disorders and the restoration of normal conditions. Um, but I do have a note here that in fact, um, for most emergencies, the city code appoints the city manager as a director of emergency services. Um, so that's kind of the general world of the mayor. Um, and again, some of the things that I think are most important, um, although I, I invite the former mayors uh, to weigh in, they may feel there are others that are more important, but setting uh, council agendas, presiding over the meetings, uh, creating and appointing subcommittees, appointing chairs of the city boards and commissions, and really uh, acting as the city spokesperson, uh, having that, that bully pulpit. Next slide. 
what are the roles and responsibilities of vice mayor? This is uh, much more simple. They simply serve uh, as mayor uh, when the mayor is absent. Next slide. Um, so currently the mayor is selected by their colleagues um, and we're now looking at a proposal to instead have um, the citywide voters elect the mayor and why. Uh, why are we uh, looking at that proposal? What are we seeking to address? What problems are we trying to solve? Um, I've suggested a few here and I'll walk through them, um, but you may have uh, other reasons um, or additional reasons um, that you are uh, considering uh, moving, having the city move to an elected, at large elected mayor. So some of the things that I've heard in talking with people, um, probably the main one is that with the council members now elected by district, uh, a directly elected mayor, at large mayor would enable the mayor to focus on the big picture, um, provide a unified, uh, unifying citywide perspective without having an obligation to any single district. Uh, also that I've heard uh, suggestions that this would allow the voters to have a direct say in who's the city's spokesperson, allow the voters to have a direct say in who sets the council's agenda. Again, agenda setting is, can be very important uh, in terms of where the city's headed. Uh, this would also allow voters to have a direct say in who chairs the council meetings. That can also be quite important and significant to members of the um, public members of the community who attend those meetings. Uh, next slide. This would also allow voters to have a direct say in who creates and appoints council subcommittees. Uh, and again, as I discussed earlier, that's often critical in establishing uh, city, new city policies and programs. Um, but this proposal also gives us the opportunity to kind of open things up. We could really open things up. Um, are there potential revisions to the mayor's roles and responsibilities that you'd like to see? Um, and I'll note here that you all received a letter um, from Peter Stanley, who's a former planning commissioner, a member of the mayor's open government task force and member of the bicycle and pedestrian advisory board, a lot of experience uh, with the city. And he suggests that we not only shift to an elected mayor, but also shift to a strong mayor form of government. And we'll talk a little bit more a little bit later about what that means to be a strong mayor, have a strong mayor system. Um, but this is this would be an opportunity to kind of open that up. What should the mayor's roles and responsibilities be? Um, and you may have other ideas of, of why you, you would be interested in at least exploring um, shifting to an elected mayor. Uh, next slide. Um, so those were some of the issues that uh, we might be trying to address, um, but there's some other aspects um, that we should consider as well. Um, in particular, we just talked about our uh, equity principles. So what are the implications for diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? Um, would historically marginalized communities benefit from an at-large mayor? Would an at-large mayor be able to better engage and support equity priority communities and other historically disenfranchised community members citywide because they're having, they have responsibility for a citywide perspective, would that give them um, better ability to do that? Um, would an at-large election facilitate diversity in the mayor position? Uh, right now, um, the only uh, individuals that are eligible to be mayor are the seven members of the council. This would open that up. Um, but would it Instead, might it instead burden diversity due to the costs of a citywide campaign? Um, currently, you can run for a district, uh, and once you're elected, uh, you do have the path to be uh, to become mayor. Next slide. Continuing on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, might we face um, the potential for racially polarized voting? Racially polarized voting is where um, uh, one group may consistently outweigh others. Um, when we went to district elections in 2018, it was to counteract that possibility of racially polarized voting. Um, the idea is that uh, you know, if you have a majority, for example, city of Santa Rosa is majority white population, um, might those votes outweigh override or dilute 
um, the votes of other communities. Um, so that's a question. Would a directly elected mayor assist in opening opportunities for BIPOC community and other uh, traditionally uh, disenfranchised population or might it uh, place some hurdles in that, in that path? Um, again, so that last slide, uh, would an open at-large election provide more opportunities for a wider range of individuals to participate more powerfully in the city government? Again, the, the um, mayorship would not be limited to simply the seven members of the council. Next slide. And then are there potential downsides to an at-large elected mayor? Um, again, I am not weighing in on, on this pro or con, but I just wanna put out some of the things that I hear um, uh, for, for the committee to think about. So the cost of a citywide campaign may limit the candidate pool. Um, a citywide election raises the possibility of a, a dilution of the votes of historically mar marginalized community. That's what I was just talking about in terms of potentially either racially or otherwise polarized um, voting. Um, and I've heard some argue also that the current system of the council selection of the mayor um, really allows for a stronger council cohesion. The council members know their colleagues and come together to select someone to lead. Um, and generally they're looking for someone who can build consensus and effectively uh, steer the ship. Um, the current system, uh, as I mentioned, also gives all the district-based council members a uh, potential opportunity to serve as mayor. And since um, the current system provides for a two-year term, uh, those opportunities arise every other year. Um, the current system also allows the council to remove the mayor in the event of misconduct. An elected mayor, as we've seen recently in our commune, broader community, uh, might only be subject um, to removal by recall. So those are kind of some of the pros and cons. Um, and you may have other ideas and you may feel strongly about some and not about others. So um, that is for your discussion. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna turn to the final section of the presentation, which is a series of um, key decision points. This is the list and then we'll talk about each one individually. First of all, what should be the, the term of office should? Second, what should be the scope of the role and responsibilities of the mayor? Should the mayor be full-time or part-time designated? We all know that they are full-time at this point, but you know, are they formally designated as full-time? Should they be a voting member of the council or a non-voting member of the council? How is the vice mayor selected? And then what is the resulting composition of the council? Next slide. So start with the term of office. Mayor currently serves a two-year term. Options, we could keep that two-year term. Um, that would mean an election every other year. Uh, we could move to a four-year term for the elected mayor. Um, that would uh, align with the current terms of the council members. Or should we look at some other version, three years, six years, or other? Of course, if we went to uh, uh, an odd number, you'd have the cost of an added election cycle. So as we talk about the, what term of office, think about the costs and burdens of campaigns and elections, the advantages or disadvantages of a shorter or longer term of office. And then um, uh, uh, there have been a number of suggestions to maybe add a term limit. So uh, maybe it's a four year term, but you can only serve two terms um, or any mix of that. Next slide. Uh, scope of responsibilities. We've talked a little bit about it. Should we maintain the current scope of roles and responsibilities, expand those uh, roles and responsibilities, narrow them, um, and or you know, even consider shifting from the strong city manager to a strong mayor system? Um, again, this is Mr. Stanley's suggestion, and we'll look at a couple of cities that have done this um, when we get to the charts. Next slide. Couple other elements. Um, do we formally, do you want to formally designate the mayor as full time or part time? And it'll affect, it could affect compensation and uh, the willingness of um, the voters to support a higher compensation if it's a designated full time position. 
It also affect expectations, both on the part of the community, expectations that the community will have as, of a full-time mayor, and also on the part of the mayor themselves. Um, uh, another element is whether to keep uh, the mayor as a voting member of the council, turn it to a non-voting position, or as one city. Done or more, but one on the list, like a tie. So this is really going to be um, tied to how is the council com uh, 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 constituted, and it may affect uh, candidate interest. Um, is there going to be the same interest if you are no longer a voting member of council? Next slide. We should think about um, the vice mayor. Um, do we want to change anything about the selection of the vice mayor? Should that still be, should the vice mayor still be selected by the council? Should the, should the mayor get to select the vice mayor from the other council members? Uh, should the vice mayor still be one term, any term limit, any change in the roles? Next slide. And then this, this is a big uh, issue. Um, how, uh, what is the resulting composition of the council? I think most often what I'm hearing is, um, folks have in mind, well, let's reconfigure from a seven district-based council to a six district-based council members and one at-large mayor. Um, if the committee decides to go this direction, uh, we'll do a deeper dive uh, to ensure that there are no legal issues uh, in reducing from seven um, district uh, count council districts to six council districts. Um, there are uh, issues under the Voting Rights Act that, that could be implicated, but we'll do, we haven't done the deep dive yet, but if that's the direction that we're getting from the council, uh, we will do that. Um, another uh, option is to maintain seven district council members and add the at-large mayor. Um, that does uh, create the potential for tie votes. In the event of a tie, uh, there is, uh, the, the council is not simply, is simply not able to act. So that can, that is why most Legislative bodies have an uneven number. Um, Senate is a notable exception. But, um, also, you could go beyond that. You could expand or contract the council membership uh, overall. So next slide. So those were really the elements that I think we should look at. There may be more as we, as we engage in the discussion. Um, so it's kind of the big picture, what are our priorities? Um, ensure a citywide perspective is on the, is on the council. Um, ensure responsiveness and strong ability to move forward on community priorities. Um, preserve the benefits of district-based representation. You know, give the, the historic, particularly give the historically disadvantaged communities a strong voice and allow a greater, uh, greater allowance for diversity uh, uh, in district-based representation. And then maintain a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging. Does at-large mayor help to support that commitment or does it not? Um, and I will also note in terms of citywide perspective, what's been our experience thus far with the district uh, council members? Uh, do we have a concern that district council members have been too focused on their districts or uh, has the council been able to maintain amongst itself um, that, um, that view of what is best uh, for the city uh, as a whole, that citywide perspective. Uh, and next slide, this is just kind of the, the um, me encouraging you to you know, think about what's your perspective? How would you like the mayorship to look? What are your goals? Does an at-large mayor further those goals. And then I'll just quickly look at, we have three slides, uh, three charts now, just to give you a sense of what some of the other cities are doing. Uh, this chart is too small to read on the um, screen, um, but it has been attached, so is available. Oh, thank you, maybe that does help. Um, and just to summarize, this is the, the North Bay City, so it includes city of Napa, a couple of cities in, um, uh, in Marin County and then the Sonoma County cities, uh, as well as the County of Sonoma. Um, of those, um, we have four, 12 cities listed. Uh, four um, have uh, elected mayors 
Uh, the remaining eight all uh, have uh, mayors that are selected by the council. Um, the, um, uh, all of them, no, I'm sorry, none of the cities have a full-time mayor and all of them in all of the cases, uh, the mayor is a voting member of the council. Next slide. Uh, going to our um, comparable cities. Again, this is the list of cities that the city itself uses uh, for salary comparisons. So we've kept that list um, to look at what, uh, what, what these cities do in terms of an, a mayor. Um, of those, we have 11 cities listed. Um, eight have an elected mayor and three have um, the, the mayor is selected uh, among the, by the council. Um, all, all of um, the cities, uh, the mayor is voting, it's a voting mayor, and uh, none of the cities have a full-time designated mayor. Two of the cities, uh, Berkeley and Richmond, uh, have a, a strong mayor uh, um, form of government rather than the strong city manager. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are just a few select Northern California cities. I took this from the uh, prior list that we had, but I took out the cities that were already listed on either the Northern, the North Bay cities or on the comparable cities chart. So it just has the others. And I did add San Jose just, um, uh, just to try to get some of these larger cities. Um, we we'll see the larger cities having a little more different structures. Um, all of these, so there's uh, six cities listed. All of them have an elected mayor. Um, four, uh, in four of the cities, the mayor is a voting member of council. Uh, one, uh, and I'll talk about Fresno and Oakland and how they're structured. Um, two of the cities have a full-time designated mayor and the rest do not. Um, the two, I'll talk just briefly about Fresno and Oakland, uh, interesting um, structures. Uh, in Fresno, um, the mayor has no vote, but has veto power over all legislative and budgetary items. So tremendous amount of power there. There is a system to override that veto, but um, that veto power is there. Um, the city's executive power is vested in the office of the mayor. The mayor alone appoints and has control over the city manager. And then the council selects one of its members to be president of the council. Um, the uh, Oakland, um, the mayor is the chief elective officer is the way they uh, word it. Um, the mayor appoints and has control over the city administrator. The mayor is the one that submits the annual budget and the mayor in Oakland votes only in the event of a tie. Um, and those are, those are just to give you some ideas of flexibility in terms of how to structure uh, an at-large mayor if we decide to go there. So next slide, happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks Sue. Um, so committee members, uh, let's uh, go ahead and stick to questions right now. Um, we'll save our uh, discussion points for after we hear the, the public weigh in. Um, at the time we get to um, our discussion points on everybody to remember that this won't have to be your final answer <laughs> because we right. have information coming, but, but, but to try to get a sense of what you're making of all this information and kind of what your leanings are. So, um, but let's start with questions only right now. And uh, anybody have a question of Sue? Logan. Thank you, Patty. Uh, Sue, thank you for that comprehensive presentation. Um, appreciated the data at the end, especially on the, on the other cities nearby. Um, my question is, is actually about how it would appear on the ballot. Um, what I'm trying to, to wrap my head around. And so you said that, we, that we're likely gonna have a ballot measure to uh, make district elections part of the city charter. 
So I'm wondering if when we do that, would we be able in the same measure to do this sort of reformulation like you laid out? Would we be able to restructure the council with six districts and an at-large mayor? Um, or would the, uh, would the type of mayor, like if we did a totally strong mayor, would that not be able to be in that same item? Um, and I know that's kind of a complicated legal question, but uh, I've just been wondering about how that would actually appear on the ballot. Uh, yes, and I appreciate that, uh, that question. Um, it would be my very strong recommendation that they be separate. Um, my concern is that if it were, if it were not successful, if the ballot measure to create the uh, elected mayor was not successful, um, it would leave us without correction to our city charter. And I do feel that it's very important that we, at a minimum, that we correct the current city charter to reflect our new reality of district-based elections. Um, we would word both ballot measures in a way that uh, identifies which one prevails. If both pass, it, pass and generally the way um, that is done, it's not uncommon for that to happen with ballot measures. The most common is that the, the measure with the most number of votes will prevail over the other, so. Okay, and if we did that and we had two measures, one making an independent mayor and one making a six member council, six member council item succeeds, mayor one fails, what would happen then? We would then have a six member council, which- Got it, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess it would retain the original mayor structure in the charter. Right. Okay. Right. Um, thank you. I think those are my questions for now. And, and if I may, I'll also note that I do understand the difficulty of having those two measures on the ballot at the same time, um, potential for voter confusion, potential for some tension between those, those two ballot measures, but we would, we would have to think about how we work through that issue. Appreciate your advice. Thanks. Yvette? Yes. Um, one of the concerns I have, you know, uh, being in a district that didn't have representation, I can see both sides of the picture in regards to this. But one of the concerns I have is that we're going to be doing redistricting that's coming up in the next couple of months. So how are we going to make a decision in the elected mayor and do the redistricting and try to make it fair and equitable for the community as a whole. So I'm a little concerned that all of this is happening at the same time. And so how are we going to be able to do all of that and still make it making sure that the community is heard and things are being fair um, as far as you know, people that haven't had the proper representation um, in the community. Uh, yes, and I, um, the, it, the, the timing is awkward, given that we're going through redistricting right now. Um, and what will come out of that is a new configuration of the seven council districts. Um, if the a measure for an at-large mayor passes, uh, and if the con new configuration is going to be six districts rather than seven, um, then we will have to come back uh, and do another redistricting um, process in order to implement that new um, new ballot provision the new so will that allow us to do, will that allow us to do the redistricting this year or will we have to wait another couple of years to do the redistricting no we have to do the redistricting this year um, under um, state and federal law, we have to do the redistricting now. Um, we would, uh, once that measure is passed, uh, if the at-large mayor uh, measure passed, we would then start a new redistricting process. We would provide in the measure as to when the effective date is. Maybe we would make the effective date, the earliest we could make the effective date would be 2024. Uh, we might want to make it 2026 in order to give us more time to do redistricting uh, to give a little bit of a breather between uh, redistricting efforts. 
but we could move quickly. And I know there are folks that would be interested in having it move quickly and having it um, uh, as the new districts established for the 2024 election. And then my last question is in relation to um, this process. Um, I know we're going to be taking it to a vote and all of that, but will there be community input in particular to this subject matter? Because we're representing, you know, our area, but then I feel like we need to hear more from the public in regards to this matter. Because again, we have not been at the table. And when in the past, when I've tried to connect with the mayor in previous years, before we had district, it was a little difficult. And, it, and I always felt like our, our area didn't get represented as well. And so I know I feel that way and many people that live in our area in District 1 and District 7 sometimes feel that way because most of the past mayors were coming from other areas in the town. And so I feel like they may be a disadvantage or in this process and, I, and it doesn't really sit well. In, in terms of um, getting com community, uh, hearing community voices, um, I am working with uh, Magali Teas, who is our um, uh, in charge of community uh, outreach and community engagement uh, division um, to get word out about these meetings, um, encourage people to attend and participate in these meetings and speak up. Um, also, um, when, once all of these uh, elements go to the council, there will be um, a, a couple of um, com public hearings at that time as well, public meetings at that time as well. Uh, but yes, um, get word out to your, uh, to your communities um, that, that this meeting is the best avenue uh, for weighing in on these issues. So. Uh, Chris? Yes, uh, thanks, Sue. And I know you haven't had a chance to take a deep dive into these thorny legal issues, but I'm wondering if you'd be comfortable making any kind of general comments in terms of from your perspective, what are the different alternatives that would uh, probably give rise to the least likelihood of a, of a substantial legal challenge on the Voting Rights Act issues? You know, Because I'm concerned that the more we dilute the power of the different districts, the more we're raising potential legal challenge, you know, whether that's reducing to six, making the mayor the tiebreaker with voting. So I'm wondering if you're comfortable making any, framing the issue for us or making any comments. I think that you've just framed it well, is the issue is, are we diluting votes um, by either, um, either having, you know, reducing um, the number of um, number of districts from seven to six, and then also uh, in the event of having, as you identified, having the mayor be the tiebreaker, um, there could be challenges in any of that. I don't. I'm not ready tonight to kind of lay out what the legal issues are, um, but once I hear a little bit more from the committee this evening. Um, at our next meeting, I'll be able to give a little bit deeper dive into what what you know, some of the pitfalls might be, so. And I would say there's no easy, there's no easy answer because either we're reducing the number of, of districts, we're adding uh, another vote, either tiebreaker or another vote um, that's non-district. If we're adding more um, members to make it nine instead of seven so that we still have an uneven number, we've divided the districts even, even further. So. Um, but once I, I have direction, I'll, I'll come back. Matt, just one other question. Is there a concern that a, a strong mayor, even if non-voting, raises Voting Rights Act issues, or is that kind of the safer territory? Um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, at this point, I don't think so, but that's a very preliminary um, analysis. Um, it's just shifting some of the responsibilities that the city manager currently holds to being the mayor. Um, the difference is that um, with a strong city manager, that is the city manager selected by the entirety of the council, whereas a strong mayor, it's the one individual who's selecting the, in general, you could structure it differently. You could structure it so that city manager still had to be selected by the full council, but the mayor 
have control over that person. So. Scott? Well, um, thanks to Chris. He just asked the question I, I wanted to ask. And I appreciate uh, if you come back at the next meeting with a little more detail on that, because I, 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 I'd hate to think we'd run down a rabbit hole potentially on it. Um, so my, my, my easier questions, which I already know the answer to, and um, when council, um, did they give any direction at all as to why they wanted this on, um, wanted us to study this, or did it just come out as a random thought? Hey, what about a direct elected mayor? And then the second question is, um, and I didn't go back and look, who exactly brought up the discussion? Um, why why it, the suggestion was made was because out of a, uh, the, the, the concern that we don't have a single citywide perspective on the council now and to bring that uh, citywide at large perspective. Um, that's um, what I have heard most, most often. Um, the concern that district represented, representatives might, I, I don't think there's any allegation that they have thus far, but might get too embedded in their district and the priorities of their district without um, th that broader city citywide view. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Jocelyn. Um, yes. Um, so I had a question about for like voters. Um, if we were go to go, we were to go with the elected mayor option. Um, would we be, since it's like the whole the community of Santa Rosa, would we be able to open it up for um, undocumented immigrants as well to vote for the mayor? As I know many in my district, um, there are a lot of um, undocumented, undocumented immigrants and um, they don't really have like a voice and like mostly in the, um, in the Santa Rosa city. Um, so I was wondering if we could um, if there's a possibility that we could open up voting for undocumented immigrants here in the districts and Santa Rosa. Unfortunately, no, the uh, is governed by state law, state and federal law. So. Anything else, Jocelyn? No, that was it. I was just had a question about that. Uh, Jen. Uh, thanks, Sue, for the presentation. I have three quick questions. Um, first, with respect to the equity concerns of an at-large mayor, wondering about the possibility of additional campaign contribution limits and publicly financed elections. Um, and then with respect to the misconduct issue, can an elected mayor be removed by a supermajority or unanimous council? Can we provide for that? And that's it. Sure. Um, in terms of uh, campaign contributions and public financing, uh, definitely both of those are possibilities. Um, so that could be included and could help really um, uh, minimize that impact of the cost of running citywide. In terms of removal um, of an elected mayor, um, there is uh, there is a path. Um, by which we could do a okay, recall is the, is the most obvious um, path to, to removing an elected mayor. Um, there is a path to have um, the council have the power to initiate hearings, providing due process to the mayor, um, at the end of which the mayor could be removed if certain findings were made. Um, I understand that San Francisco um, has that um, provision and we can look at that and I can bring that back um, at, at our next meeting um, as a possibility. Um, I did not include S San Francisco in the um, charts simply because it's a um, city county um, a, a jurisdiction. So, but we, we can look at that. So there there is a path, I understand that it is not um, it's not simple, but it is a path with a with a hearing and and due process. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Sue. So, 
as a whole for the voters for the city of Santa Rosa, do you know what the breakdown is uh, for uh, voter turnout per district? Thinking of uh, what Yvette was saying earlier about you know uh, a district that hasn't had representation before, was wondering what that looks like per district as far as a voter turnout uh, for uh, mayor at large. Also considering the fact that for equity and equality, for those can potential candidates uh, from districts that no uh, didn't have a voice before, um, thinking that uh, through. Um, that, is, that is a very good question. And I do have those, um, uh, those statistics at least um, prior, I can probably get the statistics even for the more recent elections. I did have those um, for the elections prior to 2018 because when we went to district elections, one of the things we looked at um, was voter turnout in terms of how we decided to structure the sequencing of districts? Um, where were the first district, you know, which districts were going to go first and which districts were going to go second? Uh, we tried to ensure that the, we happened to be in a, in an, um, not a presidential election in 2018, and of course, a presidential election in 2020. Turnout overall is always better in a presidential election year. So we, um, we determined to have the districts that had the traditionally lower voter turnout on those um, presidential election years so that try to encourage, um, you know, to try to get a higher voter turnout in those districts. Um, but I'll sure, uh, we can sure get the, that information. I don't think it'll be um, terribly difficult and we'll bring that back also. Jasmine. Thank you, Chair Cisco. Um, I wanna appreciate Jocelyn for asking um, the question and hopefully um, at some point we can have a conversation to examine how we enable the participation of undocumented um, residents here in our community, even if it's not through council elections, but you know, engaging in um, committees and boards. Um, my question on this issue was, um, is it possible, um, uh, Attorney Gallagher, to um, receive like um, articles or just like research on this topic ahead of our meetings um, as, as like as appendices to the presentations, maybe to be able to educate ourselves more on like how these um, um, proposals impact like efficiency of government, um, equity and representation for um, minorities in our community. Um, if there has been any research, I tried looking up myself and there has there wasn't really anything like recent that I found. So, um, you know, the lot like there were like articles from like the 80s and, you know, a lot <laughs> has changed in 40 years. It yeah. has been 40 years since the 80s. Um, so that was also alarming. But um, anyway, I was hoping if, the, if it's out there, um, it'd be great to have it accessible. And then, um, yeah, my other question was, if we could also receive more information on not only the legal implications of an at-large um, mayor in terms of what is um, potentially could be challenged in, in law, but also like what was the, ra the legal rationale for the um, ju judge ordered like district elections? Like why, uh, you know, because the legal rationale I think is important to, um, to be able to, um, just like know what's good um, for our community in terms of representation, because even if something falls within um, the legal realm, even if it's legal, um, doesn't mean it's equitable or that it's going to actually, you know, be reflective of our community. And so, you know, just hopefully we can get more information on that. And I think those are my questions for now. Thank you. Yeah, we will um, bring back also um, both the legal rationale for district elections and sort of that in that realm of what might be issues um, if we if we change the structure of the seven districts. Um, and also we'll we'll try to bring um, some more information on, on undocumented, uh, the role of undocumented individuals uh, in in local government. Um, and um, we have tried to find some general um, 
articles to be helpful. Um, and if we find some good ones, we'll, we'll, we'll distribute them. Um, one of our issues too, is that whenever we send, now that the council, now that the committee is constituted and, act, and active under the Brown Act, once we provide, um, we have to provide any information that we provide to you, we need to provide to the public at the same time. And so then we get constrained by when to, when are the publication dates and so forth. But um, I know it's a little frustrating to get the materials just so, um, you know, just the week before the meeting. So, but we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. Thank you so much. Anna. Hi, good evening, everyone. Okay, so this question is for our city attorney. So I remember reading on the Press Democrat this that this will be the first year that we will have a translation of ballots in Spanish. I just wanted to get a confirm of a yes or no from the city mayor. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, all of the um, the ballot materials will be um, will be translated. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sure. Ernesto. Hey, Madam Chair, a uh, quick question on slide 17. We have our, our, our list of key decision points. Uh, is, is that an appropriate place to also include the fundamental question of whether we should uh, propose moving towards a directly elected mayor? Yes, exactly. Thank you. And Mark. Sue, thank you for the comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, just as a follow-up to, uh, to the question that was asked by Jocelyn, um, is, is there a chance that undocumented uh, residents can vote in a referendum, on a referendum item? I don't believe, I'll do, I'll do more research as to whether there's any avenue for undocumented individuals to vote um, but it is my understanding at this point, and again, I, I could prove myself wrong with, with some more research, but that um, you do need to be a citizen in order to vote in any, in any election. And that's under state and federal law um, that we don't, don't have control over, um, but I can certainly do some additional research as to whether there's an avenue and whether as a charter city, we, would, we might be able to, um, to expand our voter right. base. And like as a just a parking lot item, if we wanted representation, but legal was getting in the way, maybe we could add a, a polling, right? Of, of yeah. it's just just parking lot item. But thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Logan. You have another question? Just on that topic, uh, there actually that was actually passed by New York City, the New York City Council, allowing. Um, yeah non-citizens to vote in local elections and uh it is probably going to have a legal challenge but anyways folks are interested in that it just took effect january 1st thank you very much and that gives me a good starting place so any other questions from the committee before i open it up to the public I do. I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but I just really want to make sure that as we're looking at the um, elected mayor, that there's something that is put in place that it will ensure that the mayor is connected to each of the um, um, each of the um, oh my god districts. Um, because I, you know, like I said before, I experienced you know various things when we had when we didn't have districts, and so I have some a lot of thoughts on that and how that could be achieved moving forward. And I think it's important that we have to make sure we put that in writing. If we do go, go to a system like that, that they, the mayor has to stay connected to each of the districts. Okay. Um, Mark, do you have another question or is you're just your hand still up? <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry, I will lower it. Thank you very much. I don't wanna leave you out here. Okay. So, okay, so with that, I think what I'll do is go ahead and open um, this item to public comment. If there are any members of the public uh, that wish to speak on this item, if you're uh, participating by Zoom, 
raise your hand, teacher, please, and uh, you'll be uh, called on to speak for three minutes. If you're dialing in by phone, do the star nine uh, feature, and uh, likewise, you'll be called on to speak. And I'll ask Ms. Vance if we have any public. Sure, Cisco, I'm not seeing any hands be raised for item 4.2, the direct elect at large mayor topic. Okay, great, thanks. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public comment on that and uh, bring it back to the committee again for um, kind of beginning our discussion, looking at the, at the, the questions um, that uh, Sue outlined for us, obviously uh, utilizing our lens. And, um, and again, this doesn't have to be your final answer at all. <laughs> But, but putting out what your concerns are, what your leanings are, uh, you know, uh, will help us uh, definitely help Sue figure out uh, where, where we're heading to potentially, and we will have more speakers next time. So, um, so with that, would somebody like to start a, the discussion? Annie, how about you? Um, I really feel like it it will be detrimental to different demographics if we have a an elected mayor. I think that will be more financially straining on people who, and I would love to hear from previous mayors on this because I know we have some, but it it concerns me that that we'll be going in the wrong direction for equality. Um, so I just kind of want to put that out there and see if anybody has a response to that. Um, Scott, you're up next and you're also a former mayor. So maybe you can help Annie with. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, 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 I share that concern. Um, having run uh, citywide for council and Ernesto can chime in uh, a citywide and I ran a modest campaign and it cost $40,000. And I know, um, Former Mayor Bob Blanchard, his second run came in at $100,000, which I think um, potentially is, is will do it. It's kind of the opposite of where we're headed in terms of, of trying to get diversity and inclusion. Um, my question is the, what problem is this solving? And Ernesto can chime in on it too. I didn't, my term as mayor and all the time on council, I thought the system worked fairly well. Um, the mayor does have the ability to um, reach out, um, you know, and set an agenda and form committees. I was able to form the open government task force, you know, and, and do those things. Uh, so I'm not sure, and yet, and yet we have the controls of council, which is a good thing. So it's not like the mayor is going to run rogue um, and do something like that. Uh, Peter Stanley's comment, I really do think going going the road to a strong mayor, changing the whole system from that to a to a um, a strong mayor where he uh, he or she basically appoints everybody. I think is is a big chunk for us to try and bite off as a community. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure council's ready to go there. So my comments to begin with. Um, Ernesto, do you have anything to add? Um just with what uh, Annie has been bringing up. I, I, I agree with what uh, Scott has said. Uh, even though the mayor has those responsibilities, for example, of appointing uh, chairs and others, making committee appointments, there, there's a process. It's not just a, a random process that they use kind of in a chamber. There are conversations with the council members kind of looking to see what council members are interested in serving on. It's, it's not an easy decision because sometimes there's more than, than one council member or more than two or three council members that want a certain position, but trying to make things equitable. But also, I think in that process is also looking to the time commitment that you have. Again, we go back to people that have full time jobs that may not be on be able to take on a committee that spent that has a lot of time commitments too. So there is a lot of work to make sure that things are equitable. And, and I agree there is there is a system in place for if you will, removing a rogue mayor, if we had such a thing in, in Santa Rosa. Uh, so those are my comments on, on that aspect of it. I do believe that it would make it more difficult to achieve what we're trying to do 
uh, with uh, diversity and inclusion within uh, the city council. Uh, I think you know, we just started the, the uh, uh, district elections in 2018. We haven't really seen them really fully implemented and used to their full potential. I look forward to that. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and the other thing I wanted to comment on saying now is it's great to have the information that you shared about what other cities are doing around California and more specific Northern California and the Bay Area. That's good to know. But at the end, it's also, we talk about this a lot on the city council and within the city, it's a local, local control is what do we want for our community because we are unique. So you know, we haven't really got into all the little nuances and details about how we're different from these other cities too. It's good to see that. But again, it comes back to reflect on who, who are we as a community and what are we trying to achieve and what is the best method of doing that using some of the other cities that have, as a guide or examples along the way. Thank you, guys. Hey, Brian? Yeah, my inclination is that status quo. Um, the system we have now, I think, works as good as any. Um, but kind of like has been referenced, uh, the, the strong legal argument in favor of district elections um, and why really we went to district elections, it seems like going to an at-large mayor is in direct conflict with, with that legal interpretation. So uh, I look forward to the answer to the question that's been asked by others. That's me. Thank you. Um, I also share some of the concerns um, regarding equity and an at-large mayor election. I think that even with you know, setting um, campaign finance limits and public um, uh, funds for campaigns, I think those are good starts, but we do have to take into account that independent expenditure campaigns can still happen and those limits are different. I'm really not sure whether we can limit those on a local basis or not. So I think that'd be something um, to explore if we're going to go in that direction. I do see the benefits of having an at-large mayor in terms of um, being able to kind of unify the vision um, of the council. But I think it's really important that if we go there, that we need to balance the responsibilities um, or the power, balance the power in terms of like, um, yeah, so like, do we make them a non-voting member? Um, and another benefit I guess I see in a stronger mayor versus a manager is that the mayor responds directly to the public, um, whereas the city manager to the whole council. And I think there's pros and cons on both. So I think if, um, for me, going at large um, would, would have to pair with a balancing of power um, so that the districts are able to, um, yeah, just like, have stronger say on the council. Um, yeah. Karen? Thank you, excuse me, thank you, Patty. Um, for me, I, I, as I, I will echo what Scott said, I'm not sure what problem we're trying to solve. Um, I think the mayors that we have had, um, you know, have been good and have, um, and I trust the other, I trust the council to know who to bring forward as mayor um, because they will work with that person. They have been working with that person. And I just am concerned that, you know, it is so expensive to run a citywide campaign that um, it be going against the equity principles in, in a lot of respect. Um, and if we are finding that council members are not looking at, at, if we're finding that a mayor who is selected from the council members is not looking at the city as a whole, we have a voice and we can say that we can in, in a variety of ways. Um, you know, I think um, as was mentioned, we haven't had districts for that long. Um, it seems like that it's working well with um, council members from you know district this district looking out for you know constituents in that district so um i would say to keep it as it is unless there's some glaring 
problem that we're trying to solve that um, hasn't been articulated. Thank you. Great. Dan, how about you? Many of the comments that I was going to make have already been made, but I'd like to briefly just uh, reiterate them and support in support of of the people that that made them. First issue is the district election or uh, the districts that we've just gone to um, that I don't think we've given um, our district elections a chance. And and so I'd like to uh, try to uh, have more experience there before we start making a major change like the directly elected mayor that that I'm not sure how that would affect districts. And I, I think it, it could affect them in a negative way. Um, the uh, second point is that the, the mayor currently has an awful lot to do, as our, our two former mayors here could, could um, uh, agree to, and um, I, the issue of giving uh, any one person more to do than like Chris Rogers is doing now or Tom Schwedhelm was doing previously or, or Scott and Ernesto were doing, um, it, it just seems counterproductive, and so I'm concerned about that. Um, the um, um, well, no one's m mentioned kind of the elephant in the room is that we do have some experience in other cities recently um, with uh, a directly elected mayors that have just turned out to be a disaster. And, and I don't need to mention the one city that's close to us that we've all are thinking about. But I mean, there's a lot of downside. And I do want to compliment staff. Sue, I want to compliment you and, and the rest of your staff uh, for your presentation. And I think your pros and cons were very good. And as I went through them, uh, I, I found that I was personally agreeing with the cons much more strongly than the pros. And, and so I want to thank you for that. And, and this, I think, has been mentioned already, and that is that um, allowing the uh, um, uh, more council members to be mayor uh, uh, you know, on kind of a rotational basis as it is now, uh, I think uh, provides for a lot of personal growth and team building uh, that I think we, we is really very, very good. So those are just a few of my comments. Most of them have already been mentioned. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. And, and uh, Logan, do you have an, another comment you want to make? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll voice uh, my support for this idea. And uh, it's for a few reasons. Um, and I want to be respectful to the previous council members. Uh, I, I do appreciate hearing your thoughts on this. But I do want to point out the job has changed a little bit since then. And we do have district elections. And so part of this is anticipating future problems, right? Because we only do this every 10 years. And I think if you look at cities with districts, there is a parochial spirit among the district members, among the council members by design. Um, they're supposed to be hyper-focused. And I think that when you look at uh, the mayor's schedule that we saw, some of that was his focus on his district. And I think that that actually can take away from that person's ability to look at the big picture um, as much as those issues might have a citywide impact, but uh, I, I remember specific items from that that were that were related to their to uh, the mayor's district. And so I actually think the workload would shift. I, I guess it would probably increase, but it also would decrease in some areas. And I think that's the positive of it is that they'll have that citywide focus. And I also think what's changed is a series of crises that we've had in the last few years, um, whether that's wildfires, which will continue to happen on a regular basis, whether that's uh, a long running crisis like a pandemic or something that's more acute, um, but is also long running like uh, the racial justice protests we saw. I think all three of those needed someone who could be more of the face of the city. And I'm not faulting any of the individual mayor's performance there, um, but I think that they had the potential to be better if they had the ability to focus solely on that. And I think also when you go beyond our community, um, when mayors are directly elected, they tend to be taken more seriously, um, whether that's fair or not. Uh, they have the will of thousands of people behind them that cover their whole jurisdiction. So when they're speaking to a member of Congress 
or testifying at a hearing, they can legitimately say, I'm speaking for every single person, every voter, every resident of the city. Um, and so I think that as we look at where Santa Rosa is going to be 10 years from now, where it's been in the past few years, I really think we need that overarching voice and vision. And I think that on the politics of equity, um, that's definitely an important point. But I think you also could sort of game out a scenario where uh, you could actually have multiple candidates from the higher turnout areas where candidates traditionally came from and maybe only one candidate from those more traditionally lower turnout areas. And you can imagine a scenario where that person could win based on that um, or in any other, there's a lot of other scenarios where they could win. Uh, and so I, I think I see that, that it would be more costly, um, although that would just be the cost of the previous at-large elections, too, um, which are significant, like, like Scott said. They're not small numbers. Um, but I just, I, I, again, I think that we need to look at some of those recent issues, look forward, and what it, we need someone who's accountable to every resident of the city. Um, and right now with districts, I just think that's not the structure we have. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing more people's thoughts on this. Scott, you have more thoughts? <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to, um, as we continue the discussion with Logan, on, on, I, I, I have a different view from him, but um, Yasmin made a comment earlier on, and I think it's important, it really wasn't clear in the presentation, no fault too, um, because we're kind of implying that the mayor has some grand ability to do, to control way more than he does. And I think it's important for everybody to realize the council sets council goals. Um, the mayor is the implementer along with the city manager of those goals, but it's not like unilaterally or she unilaterally just decides, I want to do this today, I want to do that tomorrow. Um, every year the council sets goals and prioritizes them. Um, and the mayor and city manager, everybody's um, answerable to the council as a whole, as a body. Ernesto? Thank you. Uh, Scott's comments are some of the ones that I was going to make as well. It, it kind of went to setting the agenda. And it's not that we're setting the agenda for the entire community. The, the community does that based on the issues that we're facing, whether it's affordable housing, homelessness, social justice, environmental issues, there's so many. Uh, and you're right, they, together together with input from the community, they set their goals. And I think that's very important. Uh, from that, then, of course, is how do you set the agendas moving forward throughout your year and how, and how you prioritize. Uh, we have dealt with crises uh, over the years. Uh, I, I had occupied. You know, we all have our, our, our crisis that we deal with. Uh, the job has changed a little bit. It will probably continue to change a little bit as we continue to grow. Uh, but I think at the end, we have to be the, uh, the ones that come together to be able to make a strong argument to the voter as to why this is so important that we need to do it today. I think we are going to, to evolve. Like Dan said, uh, the, the district election process has not really settled in yet. Uh, it, it may be in nine, seven, eight years, 10 years, it'll be time to make that change. Uh, and that next group will be having that tough discussion about how to make that happen at the time. Uh, but again, for me, it still comes back to what are we trying to fix today? Uh, because uh, I, I don't believe that we really given our current system a chance. And um, again, my biggest worry, my biggest worry is the issue related to, to equity and inclusion in, in our city council. Chair Cisco? Yes, who is that? <laughs> is that Mark? Yes, it is. Get ready to call. Uh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I. Uh, I'm in agreement with the concerns raised by uh, former Mayor Bartley, member uh, Condren, and Oliveris uh, and Godino, that this could, has a has a high risk of watering down the impact of district elections. Um, I think that impact has been very favorable. I don't think political gaming would be in favor at all of people in the unrepresented districts. Um, I'm highly skeptical of that, and. Um, Right now, somebody in a smaller district can actually run for that district with a lot less money. Um, I'm concerned somewhat about independent expenditures. We're not gonna be able to limit those at all. Um, also, in the underrepresented districts historically, we're gonna have new voters coming in. And we'll have more, uh, more, inform more informed voters. 
So they will be able to identify the issues, present them. Um, they're, they're younger people coming up. So if you look at the underrepresented districts, they tend to be younger. And so they're coming up, getting involved in politics for the first time. And then looking down the road 10 years from now, I think I'll know more about other people's needs. And that's my, my hope and my goal. And uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of uh, the elected mayor. I'm, I'm not sure if we didn't even have, we didn't fully address the question of who's pushing for this and where it came from and why the push is. And I'm curious about that. Um, we're gonna have a lot of weight on this issue on the agenda of other mayors coming in from elected positions, maybe consultants and such. And that just gives such a huge bureaucratic weight that I'm uh, concerned that'll overweigh the decision-making of this panel as to why it's in scope and how long we wanna deal with this in comparison to other issues. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, how about you? Did you just say me? I said Danny, because I want to give him an opportunity and then I'll get back to you, Yvette. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Patty. So my concern is this, you know, I, I think I agree with everybody where uh, we're trying, I'm trying to figure out what the what the problem is that we're trying to solve. I, I, I hear that loud and clear. My concern is reverting back to uh, the way it was previously before district elections, where um, it was at large districts and, and certain parts of uh, Santa Rosa were, were neglected until we went to district elections and we had a loud voice that, that voiced concerns for those communities. And now I see that there's resources and, and, and support coming to those areas. Now I'm wondering if we do go to mayor at large, is that gonna add another layer to get things done? Um, where now it seems like everyone comes to the table representing each district, They're, they bring their concerns and, and they come up with a solution. With the at-large uh, at mayor, does that mean that now we have another layer that we got to go through to get something resolved? Um, and also the other concern is with this at-large, I believe that the, uh, that the mayor will, will primarily come out of the other side of the uh, neighbor, the railroad tracks, if I just may say, and stay there and the focus will continue to stay on that side of San Rosa versus where it's really needed. Because obviously we know that money pays for the attention that a community gets. And if we were the mayor at large, I think that it would be unfair to those communities that have been historically neglected and haven't gotten the resources that they needed. And with an at-large mayor, with the cost to run the election, it's gonna stay on the nicer part of Santa Rosa. And that's where the candidates will primarily come out of. And it's, it wouldn't give the, the potential for other candidates or council members that the way we're doing it now to be able to step up and become uh, the mayor. And, you know, I think currently the way it's working, Chris Rogers is doing a phenomenal job. I think he keeps an eye and is very fair and he looks out through all the districts. So again, going back, trying to figure out what is the problem that we're trying to solve. And I think that that's unclear. And if we could find uh, more info as far as where it's coming from, where this request is coming from, I think you'll clarify and give us more, uh, clarity on what we're trying to resolve. Great. Eva? Okay. Um, I just had, well, a question and some comments. And so the first question in, in the scope of equity and all that, I wanted to find out, um, I know our meetings are recorded. And so when it's placed out for the public to see, are they being translated? Is it in a different language? Because the population that I tend to work with, they speak Spanish. And so I'm coming in regards to um, equity. I wanna make sure that piece is there. So if somebody can answer that. And then the other question I had was, how difficult has it been in the past to have someone step up and say they wanna be mayor or how, how often did they decline? Was it, was it something that they was like, no, nobody wanted to do it. So we need a little a backstory, a little history in regards to that from, from past mayors or for past council to find out was that something difficult for them to do or people didn't want to step up. And then the other thing I, I've really been thinking about this a lot is the question, do we have to do charter review every 10 years? Because for me, when things are set in stone for 10 years, we're bound by that for 10 years. So in, in, in listening to everything that we're talking about, is it possible for the charter review to be maybe shift it to five years or seven years so that that gives us time 
to see the process. And then if we don't like what's going on, then we have the ability to come back to the board, the, the charter review and start making those implementations or the changes we need to make. So where did that 10 year thing come from? You know, I, I've been sitting on a lot of different boards and commissions and I'm hearing this 10 year large span when there's so many things that happens in the community as far as fires and emergencies, and then we're bound by these, these ordinances and these laws for 10 years. So my question is, where does that come from? Is that something that we as a group can change and say we wanna lessen the time frame and make it five years so that we can come back and, and we'll have a, a move and live in document that we can make adjustments to it in a, a shorter time frame versus 10 years. Sue, do you want to respond to that? Sure. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. And yes, that is certainly, it is currently in the charter and it's certainly a, something that can be adjusted. And in fact, I, I think that the current language is a little bit unclear, um, but uh, yes, this committee would be free to recommend a, um, a change to that 10 year period, either to a date, you know, to some other time frame, or to make it, um, uh, even more flexible. So. Okay. Dan. And what about that translation? Sorry, what about the translation? I need to step on you there. Um, I would ask the city clerk whether the tapes are translated or whether the, I know they're translated live. I don't know if that's recorded as well. It is not. Um, the videos are currently not translated into Spanish and uploaded um, right now. Um, I'm going to, can we work on that? Because that is something that's being worked on, but um, it does take some equipment um, and changes that are being looked, currently being looked at. Um, I'm working with IT to see how that can be done. Um, that would be very helpful to me to get it out to the community. Um, in, in my district. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dan. Um, one issue uh, that I don't think has been brought up yet tonight that I, I wanted to bring up, and, and that's the uh, issue of the city manager. And I think we've had some wonderful city managers in, in the past and uh, several that I can, can certainly think of. And like, we just have a brand new city manager now and I just met her the other day and I, I think she seems terrific. And so my, my issue is our ability to recruit uh, these, these very high quality city managers. And I would think that the, the topic we're discussing right now will impact the quality of person that we would be able to recruit in the future. And so that relationship between the mayor and the city manager is so crucial, whether we have a directly elected mayor or, 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 or the, 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 the system that we have now, we need to think of how it will impact our ability to recruit strong city managers in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on my comments earlier um, about the powers of the mayor. And um, as I think we are considering at large mayoral elections for the current structure that we have now um, without really, of course, because it was broken out into meetings without deeply examining how structures, um, you know, a manager um, city versus a strong mayor city, what that would look like and what that would imply um, for our operations and our elections as well. And I think those um, um, benefits and consequences are important to analyze before we really, I think, set in stone. Obviously, we're doing that now, but I think that I do think that it is possible to be able to garner the elements of different structures to be able to uh, make something that works for us here in Santa Rosa, um, because we are a unique city. And I think I do think that there are benefits um, from an at-large mayor um, in a different structure, um, different than what we have now, um, perhaps with different responsibilities as it relates to city mayor. And of course, um, that's also related to Dan's comments. Okay. Uh, Karen, you were there, you left, are you done? Did you have something else you wanted to add? Okay. Um, one other, can I make one other comment, Patty? Oh, good. 
sorry, just quick. You know what Jasmine said, I think is a really good point and that we're just talking about the the first line we'd have to cross, you know, a yes or no. But I think it, it could be worth us exploring more of those duties that were laid out. And maybe we would just want to change some of that. Maybe it's not called a strong mayor or maybe it's uh, called that, but it has different powers than what other strong mayors have. But I, I do think it's worth at least looking through some of that. Um, if folks aren't ready to go that far to the directly elected mayor, maybe at least examining uh, some of their duties. Um, that might be a whole nother meeting. I don't know if we have time for that, but uh, I think there does seem to be a desire here at least to kind of look more at that role. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Logan. Um, so we're getting close to um, our seven o'clock time and I and we have a couple of other things to get through before we close, but I want to really um, thank the committee for your thoughtfulness here. Again, it's not our final decision. We'll have an opportunity to get uh, some of this information uh, from Sue and um, hear from other uh, individuals while we, we, we try to parse this out. Um, I will just say for myself, um, having heard this is an issue on our list of things to take up, I don't know that there's a push for it. I think the council just listed things and gave us the responsibility of doing the deep dive as to whether it made any sense. And um, I kind of came into this, well, 10 years ago, I was on the, the, uh, the charter review uh, uh, committee at that time and we took up directly elected mayor and uh, the entire committee determined it was Santa Rosa did not need that, it wasn't time for that. Um, I kind of came into this thinking, maybe it is time and was thinking um, along the lines of an, what I started to think was an equity lens <laughs> of having somebody that represented all of Santa Rosa as opposed to you know just uh, the districts. And some of the reading I did, and, and I agree, there's not a lot out there, but I was just kind of looking up what are some of the discussions pro and con for a directly elected mayor. and. What I started to see was that actually, if what we want is equity, inclusion, and diversity, we're on the right right path. More cities, from the discussion points I was catching, were moving in that direction versus a solidly elected mayor. Um, I definitely want to hear more uh, from you know our next meeting, but. Um, it's, it's sort of changed my thinking in terms of well. And when I hear like, would there be a challenge by the, the Voting Rights Act? It, I'm just concerned that uh, the way that I was thinking that this would uh, provide equity might be uh, actually the opposite is true. And, and, I, and I hear Logan and Jasmine, there's arguments on both sides. So I definitely wanna hear more about it, but um, and certainly the response that I'm hearing from a lot of the committee members here uh, makes me think like that as well. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've gotten districts, we have the cab, we have the council that manages the city manager. I mean, we have a lot of, of things in place that um, are furthering our desire for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so I guess when I hear what problem we're we trying to solve, I'm, I'm hearing that question differently than I thought I would hear it coming in tonight. So, um, Okay, Karen, you have one more thing you want to add before we move on? Yeah, and I don't know if now is the right time or not, and it's a procedural question. Um, and at the beginning, Sue indicated that next meeting, or Patty, you indicated that we were going to be hearing from a, a number of uh, mayors and city managers, and I wonder if that's really necessary. Um, and I, so that's my, that's the procedural question, or maybe just hear from a few, you know, one person, one or two, um, instead of taking a whole meeting to, and I don't know if that was the intent was to take the whole meeting. I mean, I'm hearing from the major, it seems like the majority of people who are talking tonight are um, in favor of the status quo with some tweaks. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to throw that out, Patty. Sorry. Um. Yeah, Sue, you want to answer that? I mean, we can. I, 
look at that agenda differently. Sure. Um, we're really here to provide information, helpful information to the committee. Um, so you know, I don't want to drive what what the presentations are. If the feeling is uh, that having speakers from um, uh, jurisdictions with direct elect mayor uh, would be helpful. Um, we'll continue on that direction. If you think it isn't needed, you know, maybe we focus in on, uh, again, trying to find more literature, um, trying to kind of an answer. Certainly I've been writing down the questions and I know Rob has as well um, for us to come back uh, next week. It was not my intent um, to have the entire meeting next week be speakers. Um, uh, so maybe we limit it to one or two speakers. Um, I think it would be helpful if we have speakers, I think it'd be helpful to have at least one um, elected, whether mayor or council member. And um, if we find a city manager who has um, worked under both systems, it might be interested, interesting to hear that perspective as well. But up to, totally up to the committee. Um, um, Ernesto, what do you think? Yeah, it sounds like you know, we do have a lot on our plate, clearly, uh, and we are going to be having other discussions related to responsibilities, roles, et cetera, that may influence this. I mean, my, my point is maybe it, is, it does make sense to table this in case we want to bring it back to have that discussion if we, we see that this is the way to address some of these other issues. But I'm hearing it, it seems to me that there's consensus that we don't want to really start moving in that direction. But it's not an absolute close the door on it because there's still more to discuss. So maybe we'd be better served by spending our energy on something different next meeting. But again, recognize that we may have to bring this back if, if that's going to be the solution to some of the things we, we come up with later on. Uh, but, but I think in the interest of time uh, and all the other things we have to tackle, we probably should go there, uh, maybe table this piece of it. Annie, what do you think? Um, I agree with what Ernesto was saying. I think that since we're going to be picking and choosing from this list of things that are being presented to us, that it would make more sense to narrow down the ones that we actually want to pursue before we do an even deeper dive. Logan? I'm still interested in hearing from those folks personally. I think that would be valuable to our deliberations and valuable to the public uh, who we have already uh, told will be happening in two weeks. Um, I, I would hope we stick with that plan. I, I really do think hearing from them will be helpful. Um, maybe if there are time constraints, it could be half the meeting or something. Um, but yeah, I was looking forward to that. Uh, Jen. Yeah, thanks. I was I was not going to comment because um, I'm in the unique position of agreeing with everybody here tonight because I think this is a really complicated issue, and I really appreciate the comments and input and experience and questions that have been raised. And so I was looking, I, like Logan, I was looking forward to hearing more next week. I I definitely appreciate Karen's point and Russell's point about the issue of time, and I think if there's but I think a, a lot of questions were raised today that might be able to be answered just in materials provided to us in the agenda packet and then keep the speakers to a minimum. Um, we can all do reading, you know, uh, on our own time. So if we could make that efficient, um, I think that that could be a win-win. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I, I don't know, um, I'll give you my answer in terms of what's the problem to solve. Um, and, and I don't know if it's a problem. Uh, we have a new city manager um, and every kind of city manager council combination is unique. Um, but what, and I think Peter St Stanley expressed this in his letter a little bit, but I think having a stronger connection between the voters and the council's goals and values and implementation of those council's goals and values is important. Um, and, and, and so it, I would love to see a way to strengthen that, even if that's a different thing than a, than a strong mayor or directly erect, uh, elected um, mayor. And I think that uh, Jasmine and, and Logan both actually mentioned that too. Like, is there a third option? I always hate to look at, at create false dichotomy. So, um, but that's the thing that I would like to do is, is create a stronger um, 
a stronger connection there between uh, I've seen I have seen council goal setting meetings that were really just not council goal setting meetings. <laughs> they were council. I, 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 I think it's important that the council's goals and, and our values are, are implemented. So that's those are my uh, thoughts that I was keeping myself, but you, you pushed me on this. So thank you. Jasmine. Um, yeah, I, I think that if we're going to have a second meeting on this um, or just talk about it a second time, I, I do think that it, it might be helpful to do it uh, at our next meeting because this will be fresher in our minds um, as opposed to doing something else and then coming back to it. Um, I think that, you know, the second half of the discussion about how different um, structures mean different things um, is huge. And I think it's important to talk about it. And you know, if our decision as collectively is still not to do uh, a at large mayor, then we'll be more secure in that decision, I think, um, having had the full conversation. Um, I was looking forward to um, our next meeting as well and hearing from uh, you know some speakers, just because I'm I'm still sort of wondering where I'm gonna land on this, but um, I do think that we could uh, plan to have our speakers, we're gonna have a time limit. Um, there's a lot of questions that were put forth here that, that can be done in materials, reading materials that we can look at. Um, and I wanna remind the committee that we also have to finish, we, we kind of needed to finish this or come up with a plan for this and then finish up uh, council compensation. So you know we can't just jump to the other list we have council compensation that uh, we all agreed, um, you know, we were taking those three things that absolutely had to be changed by charter. And so that one was um, tied to this. And so that's again, another deep complicated uh, conversation. I think we're gonna need that full meeting. Um, uh, even if we come to a quick conclusion on the mayor part, we're, we're gonna need the rest of that meeting to start that conversation and hopefully complete it. Um, so, um, and then we'll move on to uh, the, the other one was the ranked choice voting is the other one that we, we decided. So, um, so you wanna add anything? No, so uh, just to, to clarify what I'm hearing is we'll, we'll come back at the next meeting, we'll have the first part of the meeting, a further discussion on the at-large mayor uh, with maybe, maybe just two speakers um, and uh, with answers to some of the questions that the committee has raised um, and give the committee ample time to discuss and talk about maybe some other options uh, somewhere in between status quo and, and an elected mayor. Um, and then we'll also put together some materials to start back on the discussion of compensation, um, try to draft up if not a formal proposal, at least some elements that we would be looking at uh, doing for that and some options that we'll present to you. And I'm, I'm quite certain that between those two topics, um, that would fill the, <laughs> fill the two hours easily. So. And then uh, the following meeting, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll move on to ranked choice voting and Diva Provo from the County Register of Voters uh, will be here to give that presentation. Uh, Lisa, do you have something you want to add? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Cisco. I just wanted to, um, just a couple of thoughts. One, I, I, I support um, continuing on uh, our next meeting and, and kind of finishing up with this. I feel like in our conversation, it, it kind of got conflated a bit between a, a directly elected mayor is about how the mayor is chosen. And then there's a conversation around what is the authority of that mayor? which then relates ultimately to council pay. But I feel like it, we would do well to kind of tease those two things out. I hear a lot about, um, and I share some of that, concerns about concentration of power and decision-making and all of those things, but that's not necessarily automatically included in how the, how the mayor is chosen. Um, and so I would just encourage us to kind of keep that in mind. And I hope that we could have the opportunity to kind of tease that out a little bit more because I do think that the role, we're gonna have a mayor either way. Um, so I think it's important to 
to take a look at that role, especially as we look at council pay, but also as we consider how we select that mayor. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Karen, you have? I do, sorry, Patty. I have, I have just one more thing and it was triggered when Sue talked about the um, next meeting talking about council pay. Could you come back with uh, the number that if the council had been giving themselves the increases every year that they were allowed, what their pay would be right now? Yes, definitely. Thank um, you. We'll, I'll bring that forward. And, and if I may just respond um, to Lisa, I, I agree. We need to kind of parse out um, how the mayor is selected, what are the implications of how the mayor is selected, and then what are the roles and responsibilities, and do we want to change any of that? Do we want to leave that piece status quo? And that those are two um, uh, related but separate um, discussions. So we'll try to tease that out a little bit more um, at the next meeting. Okay, again, thanks for all your input. And uh, let's go ahead and move on to um, item number five, which the chair city attorney's report. Anything you want to report to? Uh, no, uh, I was going to report out on kind of what the schedule is, but we've already talked about that. So I think we're okay. good. Okay. And I don't have anything right now either. Uh, we have no submitted reports, no written and or electric electronic communications. And um, we've discussed future agenda items. Um, I can go ahead and ask uh, the, for the public to um, weigh in if they choose, take public comment on future agenda items. Um, and so we'll go ahead and open that opportunity. Raise your hand if you're on Zoom, dial star nine if you're phoning in. And I will ask Nina to let me know if anyone is there. Chair Cisco, I see no hands being raised for item eight, future agenda items. Okay. Well, we are going to end right on time. I'm so impressed. Okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting and we'll reconvene on February 2nd. And again, thank you all. Okay, good night.